worthy to be praised. Oh, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Oh, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Oh, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. Oh, great is the Lord, and greatly to be blood and righteousness is all my life and fullness the finished work forever sealed in Jesus' blood
sing. Worthy is the Lamb, Christ Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb forever. Worthy is the Lamb, Christ Jesus. Sings 
my soul Oh, this sings my soul Oh, this sings my soul oh, You are ever faithful
there's no love like yours, none compare. There's no love like yours, none compare. <laughs> there's no life like Your kingdom come, your will be 
Lord Jesus, come take your power, come rain. Rain over me. Lord, take your power, come rain. Rain, oh God. Over me, come take your power and rain, oh God, over me. It's just like heaven, just like. Walking in the spell of shit, 
walking in this glorious heavenly love It's just like heaven Father, come take your power Come and reign Lord, I'll worship you by the Holy Spirit that you've given in this new creation that you made oh living god glorify the name of jesus holy spirit come make him known revealed today Be revealed, be glorified in my life. Be revealed, be glorified in this earth, God.
of your love, the rivers of your joy, the rivers of your peace flowing out of me.
Happy to be in the abiding place this morning. I'd rather be here than any state in the United States or any other nation in the world. I love this church. I love the people in this place. This end of year today, you're searching for this place called Love, Joy, Peace, Life. You're searching for the realms of God. Search no more. You know, I've, I've even noticed that so many people, even in the church, as it were, they searching. Somehow they haven't heard the message that the Lord's opened up the door and he came searching for us. He opened up the door of life to us and said, come on in. Step into this realm of glory. Step into this realm of love. I'm not searching. I've been found. And... You know, it just, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to live the life of God. Hallelujah. Everywhere we go in the world, here, sit down. Go ahead, sit down. Everywhere we go on the earth, people are looking for, the, they're looking for God. They're looking for the life of God. You know, I'm so blessed by all those folks that are out right now taking care of all the children they went and gathered up. Not to indoctrinate them into a religion, but to love on them. Because only God, the Holy Ghost, can reach down into the hearts of men and change their hearts and change their life. People want to change the outer part of, be, of men. They want to change the behavior. You've got to have laws and, and you've got to have policemen and you've got to have governments and military forces to try to enforce that. And that still doesn't work. Father's come to change the heart of men. He's come to change the heart of men. Only God, the Holy Ghost, can do that. And he communicates his love to us by his word. Jesus said, my word is spirit and it's life. He came and declared to us this, these most wonderful and marvelous things about how much God loves us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Some of you don't understand how that is that God could have a son. Well, what Father did was he made a miracle for you and me because man chose sin and iniquity. If you don't believe man chose sin and iniquity, look around a little bit more. Look around a bit more. I mean, if you could just make everything disappear out of San Diego, California right now, out of Southern California, except for what God created, the trees, and just remove men from the equation. Okay? And remove the consequences of men from the equation. It's really very beautiful, very peaceful. Are you with me? Yeah. It's very, it looks, now just start, now start superimposing upon it all that is. Because we live in a very corrupt world. If you don't know it, San Diego is, has deep iniquity. Southern California has deep iniquity. Sex slave, slavery that goes on here of, of little children even. So that men can fulfill some deep need that they have as they watch the destruction of a human being. Through the activities of demon spirits. Do you know that that's how a lot of people get their jollies? They watch demon spirits actively do something to destroy another soul. And that's how they get all fulfilled. God in his love and his mercy, looking at man in his sin and in his iniquity and his corruption, said, okay, I'll be made like one of them. I'll be made like unto them. God worked a miracle in you know, he made himself into, as it were, to a holy embryo and was implanted into the womb of a, of a young woman and virgin of the house of David, a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of Adam, so that he could take on our sins and our iniquities. Elizabeth, she's not in here right now, but Elizabeth's getting ready to do a Christmas play this year, and it's, going, and it's going to be entitled this year, Born to Die. Christ Jesus, Born to Die. Because we were like, you know, hovering around the manger scene, little baby Jesus, 
so beautiful, so peaceful. But he was born to die. He, born, he came into this world for one reason, to take upon his own self the sins of the whole world. You know, if there's anything I want people to walk out of here with today is the, re is the revelation that change for you is just one prayer away, but it's a radical prayer. It's a prayer that says, I'm done with my life. I'm, I'm done with my life. I'm done with living this life. I want to live your life. I want to live the God life. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who was called Saul of Tarsus, uh, who was contemporary with the Lord Jesus Christ as he was growing up. A lot of people don't realize that. That Basically, you know, Paul, Saul, Saul of Tarsus was pretty, pretty much the same age as Jesus. So while Jesus was growing up in Nazareth, being just silent about who he was, being in subjection to his mother and to his father until the time that he should be revealed to Israel as to who he actually was, Saul of Tarsus was sitting at a very famous rabbi's feet, Rabbi Gamaliel, of whom there is much, you know, written literature about even to this day, learning about how he might somehow, through mitzvot, through giving himself to learning righteousness and giving himself to the commandments of God, get a little closer to God. Might, he, might, might attain into a mystical fellowship and one day potentially if enough mitzvah is done and much, enough righteousness is done, an acceptance by God, a fellowship with him, to be able to sit at the table with the Almighty. And, and that, that isn't some concept of, you know, this elite class. This is just being able to fellowship with his love, his joy, his peace, his life. Because if you haven't noticed, the world lives in hate and strife and envy. I mean, there's destruction all around us. Somebody said, well, we think that the earth, the men are starting to become better. Are you kidding me? Well, you know, someone said, well, compared to the Roman Empire right now, the Western civilization doesn't look too bad. Are you kidding me? Look around, dear people. Look around, look a little bit further, look a little bit deeper, look under the layers of that which seems to appear on the surface. Man at the very heart, at his very heart is full of sin and iniquity and everything unlike God. And here he gave his laws, he gave his commandments, gave the instruction of his ways through his servant Moses. And here comes Saul of Tarsus wanting to understand how can I begin to learn the ways of God? How can I begin to take a hold of what life is really all about? Hoping for one day that there's a possibility he could be acceptable to God. He could truly be acceptable to God. Then one day, as he was persecuting the church, because he was a zealot for the law of Moses, he was a person persuaded that anybody who messes with, with this wonderful declaration and revelation of God's worthy of death. Anyone to come along and distort it and pollute it and somehow hide the only possibility of man being able to escape this destruction that he's imposed upon himself, that that person's got to be taken off of the, off of the earth and, and no longer allowed to exist has an encounter with Jesus. The one who came, bore our sins on the cross so that you and I could go free, not of just a guilt and a shame and a consequence of sin, but we could go free of a nature of it. There's people running around right now, they're just so full of the lust of the flesh. All they can think about is finding a girl or finding a guy. And all they can think about is not how to love, but how to somehow fulfill some self-gratification that, that is insatiable. It's an appetite that is going to go, it's like a parasite. It's like... It's the, it's the worst kind of thing. And they call it normal, they call it natural. It's normal and natural in the realm of sin and iniquity, in the realm of demon spirits. It has nothing to do with the life of God. The life of God is all about love. A love that is impossible to know or understand until you and I have a heart change. All we can know about is love that has a selfish motive for self-gratification for our own purposes. Something to fulfill a need that we have for ourselves rather than to bless someone else and to fulfill a need that they have to be loved. 
God so loved the world that he wasn't willing to see men full of sin and iniquity remain there. I, I think that the most puzzling thing to me is that men was able, have been able to see this wonderful glory of God and his goodness and they still love sin. Because this really comes down to one of two things. You either into sin or you into righteousness. And when all of a sudden you get into righteousness, you get into this love and this joy and this peace and this purity and this goodness, you discover there's no way to live it. You've got to have a heart change. God comes and shows us in a whole other way of living, opens up the door and provides for us the ability to lose our life, to no longer, to no longer live, but to literally have his life, to receive the very life of God. Everybody's got a choice. You can choose. You want your life? You want the ways of men or do you want the ways of God? And when you get serious about this, when people get serious about it, and I've seen people in every religion get serious about wanting to get out of the sin and iniquity, but there's no way out. Saul of Tarsus was sincere about wanting to get out of sin and iniquity, about wanting to know God, but there was no way out. He describes it in his writing in Romans chapter 7. He describes what it was like to live as the people that were chosen by God for one purpose, to bring forth the Savior. God couldn't bring forth the Savior in the jungles of the Congo. Because if you've ever been in the Congo, it's wild and it's, it is weird and it's dark. Anthropologists say, leave the Congos, people of the Congo alone. Leave the people of Iri and Jaya alone. You don't know how wicked and how, how twisted it is. There's no way the Messiah could come forth in all of that mess of literally worshiping demons, evil spirits. You know you're worshiping evil, but you're doing it so that you could appease the evil so that it won't destroy you. Take away your children, take away your crops, all these other things that goes on in the superstitions of men, but they're superstitions well founded in the tyranny of darkness tyranny of demonic manipulation. Saul of Tarsus looks and beholds the door. Suddenly he beholds the righteousness of God that was revealed by the law, but he could never attain to it. A righteousness that he could see and understand when he viewed the commandments of God. But every time he would try to give himself to walking in this way of such of love and life and goodness and godliness, he would find that there was still on the inside of him a nature that still envied and still was full of strife and still was full of lust and still was out of control. Why? Because man chose darkness. He chose, he chose to walk in a realm of, of allegiance to the demonic rather than a fellowship with the divine. Suddenly he encounters righteousness. He encounters the righteousness of God. And that which was once mystical to him, suddenly he was trying to acquire through obeying God's commandments and doing everything he possibly could do to please God as he revealed himself through the law that he gave to Moses, to the people of Israel. He finds all of a sudden there's a new life to live. Jesus said, Paul, he said, Saul, why do you persecute me? He said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. I'm the one who came, bore your sins at Calvary's cross, died for you, went down into hell, have the keys of death and life, and have raised up again so that you can have a transformation of your life. There's a lot of people who come into Christianity only for just another religion, just another religion. Did no heart change, there's no nature change. They still just is talking bad about people and other ones and pointing fingers of accusation. They have no demonstration of his love, no demonstration of his joy. They have no demonstration of his peace. Saul wants to begin a bit about envy and strife. Just maybe a little bit different context. They do it a little bit different way. Maybe not running to all the bars and nightclubs and doing all that thing anymore. You know, looking, searching to try to find something that will fulfill them, make them happy. 
in that realm. Now they're doing it in the religious realm. And it's the same way with every other religion out there. It doesn't, I don't care what a Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. I don't care what it is. Believe me. We were just in Kashmir. And we had a devout Muslim driving us around. But as soon as he got perturbed a little bit, he was ready to go beat some people across the head, wasn't he? He said there would be all pious and talk about this thing, that thing. But as soon as the person didn't even do anything, I'm like, I'm embarrassed. So this guy's my driver. I don't even know who he is. <laughs> He's hopping out of the car, right? Going to the slamming on the person's fan, banging on the windows, screaming at him, ready to kill him. Man, man, things weren't going his way. It wasn't happening fast enough. I don't know where they thought, thought. I don't know what was going on. Well, I know what was going on. In his heart, I knew what was going on in his head. I have no idea. Maybe he thought he was going to get a bigger tip if he got there faster. We were in a hurry. We were really in a hurry. No, he said to me, he said, you know, we all worship the same God. And I thought, Lord, how do I answer this man? We're just not something that he's going to. I don't want to argue with anybody. I'm not interested in arguing. Well, what is arguing going to do? Arguing just make the matter worse. I'm interested in arguing. How do I answer this guy? So I said to him, as the Lord spoke to me, I said, you know, it's really, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm amazed. I had no idea that you guys worship Jesus. <laughs> you know, he's shy. <laughs> I don't know why he thought that we worship the same God. I don't know how that came about. There's a lot of people, somehow they have mixed up all the religions into one little can, shook them together and made soup. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. His name is Jesus. God gave one means by which we could be saved. Why? Because he made one, one human being. One human being. God became one human being. He's in the flesh today. Did you know that God is still a human being? God's still a human being. But not in the sense that Hinduism teaches God is a hint. God became flesh. One God became flesh. And when he rose up from the dead, he rose up with an immortal human body with scars in his hands. Would you like to see him today? Yes. You see him, you start acting like him. You see him. Suddenly, God feels us so, we find ourselves so filled with life that death has to leave. The death of disease, the death of sickness, the death of fear, the death and the corruption that is in lust and iniquity has to leave. You see him, begin to see him who he is and what he is and the opportunities that he's made for us, a way for, to live. Suddenly you realize you've been sipping out of the septic system all your life thinking it was delicious. It's all the emotions that you knew, all the feelings that you knew. Men live in sorrow. Men live in shame. And God's made a way for us to be able to step out of all of that and come into joy unspeakable. Amen. So, that we can, so that we can be redeemed. And the redeemed of the Lord come with singing unto Zion. What is Zion? Zion's heaven. It's a heavenly realm. What is the realm of the Holy Ghost? It's heaven. I'm living in heaven right now. People say, well, I don't believe in loving God and send anybody to hell. No, people send themselves to hell. They're making choices every day. I make a choice to live in heaven. Too. Jesus is the only way. He's the, only, he's the door. He's the only means to go into this realm. I uh, some Buddhist priests sitting around going, they, and, um, they were in a meeting and there was a healing meeting. And they said, how do, how do you do that? Because they try to whip themselves up into a state that is very, it has a certain similarity to the realms of the Spirit of God. But it's still foreign. See, Satan can manifest himself as an angel of light. He knows about the anointing. And he can give you a state, almost a feeling of ecstasy. And in that, if they get to that realm... There can be signs and wonders in America. I mean, you, you, you were practicing Hindu. You understand that? I'm, of course, Buddhism is the of Hinduism. And they say, how do you do that? How do you get in that state? 
What do you mean? I live in this. I'm going to have to whip myself up in that. What do you, what, how do you do This is the salvation that Jesus brought. This is a new creation where he changed my heart. He changed my heart and he changed my spirit. I don't have the same heart I was born with. Both my parents, ministers of the gospel, but I don't have the same heart that they gave me a wrong heart because they're descendants of Adam. And because of Adam's sin and transgression against God, all, sin came and possessed all humanity so that we were born in sin and every day taught to be like the powers of darkness, to have all of our feeling, our gratification, our need, our emotional desires wrapped up in things that belong to a realm of destroying somebody by our acts of self-gratification. All sin has destruction to it all the way to the sin is death. I don't care how you pare it down. People get lost in the forest because of the trees. Get yourself a 30,000 foot view of life and just look at it in real simple terms. It's either godliness and righteousness or it's sin or it's iniquity. It's either bringing a blessing of life and liberty and setting people free and concerned and caring for them more than for yourself that you're willing to die for them or it's a self-gratification and imposing upon them whatever your need is at the expense of their own existence and well-being. Sure, this is humanity. Look around. I mean, come on, there's 5,000, there's almost 5,000 years of recorded history dating back to ancient Sumerians in Mesopotamia. Look, <laughs> the data's in, people. There is no questioning about the difference between the realms of light and darkness, good and evil, truth and lying. No, a place of righteousness in the sinful state of men in the heart of iniquity. I think so, what's amazing to me is that God comes and he shows his love and he, and, the, and he shows his glory. He shows his beauty and his splendor and his, shows his love and his joy and his life. I mean, just when you step into heaven, I mean, heaven is a beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, I'm in heaven right now. Heaven is communion with God. It's where he takes over your emotions and your passions and your feelings and your desires and your appetites. It's a place of absolute peace that passes understanding. I, I'm sorry, you won't be able to understand what I'm trying to talk, tell you about right now because there's no words I can describe it or put it in because it's peace that passes all understanding. It's a love that goes beyond knowledge. Sorry, I can't communicate something to you intellectually that you can have some mental affirmation or response to because it goes beyond all of that. So that, that you've got to have, you've got to be born into. Yeah, to be born into this existence. I have no idea what it's like to be a cow. And I do not ever want to know what it's like to be a cow. <laughs> I have no idea what it's like to live the life of a monkey. And I never want to understand. I have no idea what it's like to be an echinodermis purpuralis, a sea urchin, sitting on a reef somewhere. I have no desire. I was not born into that and I don't want to, I, I don't want to be. <laughs> Praise God. And neither can, neither can anybody understand what it means to be made a new creation, to be born of God, to be born of the Spirit. To walk in this love that goes beyond knowledge. This joy that is unspeakable and glorious. You were born in it. Jesus came and he showed it and he's, and he's reproduced it over and again. Over and again through the generations of men for the past 2,000 years. Over and again. Great sweeping changes. Changed nations. It's been so, you know, there's been so abused. Religion has, has misrepresented Christ Jesus, but it swept the world. Swept the world. Swept the world. We lived in a relative time of peace because of this wonderful gospel of peace. It's true. I don't care how you look at it. Just go make yourself a student in history. Just turn the pages and look. Something happened. About 2,000 years ago, something happened to humanity. Something happened to the nations, the populous nations of the world. Something began to happen. Shifts begin to take place. I mean, there's still, there's still, as we've seen, the World War I, World War IIs, and all those other things that stretch back and the oppressions of men. I'm not saying that there isn't, but I mean, there is still a shift. Christ Jesus came into the world, and an opportunity was given to all men to come into a fellowship with God that before was not available. Was not available. God called Abraham. He separated himself, one man from Mesopotamia, one man of the descendants of Adam, one man, 
and said, listen, I need somebody, I need a family. I need somebody who will walk with me, somebody who will allow me to teach them what life is all about. Abraham was willing to do that so that God could bring forth the Messiah, he could bring forth the Savior. And he's come and he's here. And this light shine in the midst of darkness and men love darkness and men love sin rather than righteousness. They can say all the genuflex and cross themselves and how much they believe in God and gods or whatever, but they love iniquity at the end of the day. The verdict's in. They love sin. They love the wages of unrighteousness. They love the oppression. They love the, the, the destruction that heats upon them this sorrow. And they don't love the sorrow because it's deception. Nobody would love sorrow. Have you ever met anybody who loves sorrow? Pain. Torment, fear, no. If men, in the, if men have a choice to say, you can live all day long in goodness and joy divine. There's not a person in their right mind that would say, oh, I don't want that. But what happens is when it comes to something that is for them a higher priority, self-gratification, these, these things that Satan has taken in the realm of deception and made bigger needs. They're not, but he's deceived men and made them bigger. He's made lust, sexual immorality, bigger than joy. You can't have both of them. He's made hate or your response because somebody did you wrong bigger than love. Can never have the both together. Think about it, people. I just want you to think about it. I want, you to, I want you to think about the light that God has given to you. And I want you to think about today, those of you, you that are here, maybe some of you, you've never really surrendered your life over to God. You don't even know what that means. I was sitting with a person the other day. I don't know where I was coming from. Oh, somewhere in the world. And she was from Armenia. And she was asking me some questions. I said, well, Jesus Christ, he came as the Savior to the world. She says, what does it mean, Savior? I've never understood this thing. Raised in the Armenian church. Armenian church goes back to the third century. Has no idea what it means. What does it mean, Savior? That's really the bigger issue of, of the problem that we're facing. People come into Christianity as any other religion... They have no idea really what it really truly means to be born again and made a new creation that he's come to deliver us from darkness and from an evil nature, from a twisted desire to fill us with the ways of his love and of his life and of his goodness. Not to, something that we attain to, not something that we strive after, but something that we're gifted by. So much so that the spirit of the Lord comes on the inside of us and he's like a wellspring springing up. He's like a river flowing out. He takes control as it were of our whole life. I mean, we still can make choices. We can still choose to hate if we want to, but why would you hate when you can live in love? It's so much better. Maybe some people got to go through a little bit of a period of time where they discover, man, hate's really bad. I mean, I've been over here in this love, and here I'm hating, and now I want to live over in the love because I feel terrible. You should feel terrible. But before you were born again, you probably didn't feel terrible. Some people do feel terrible about hate. But they don't know how to get out of it. They don't know how to go and say humble themselves and say, forgive me, I was wrong. Huh? People don't listen to understand, they listen to reply. You understand that? Yes. It's men. It's men. God came to deliver us from that. I'm, I'm never going to be, I'll always be rather amazed at the, how that, when we read in Revelation chapter 20, how that when the Messiah, when Christ Jesus returns, sets up his kingdom on the earth and rules and reigns for 1,000 years on the earth with the resurrected saints, that's me and you and everyone who's believed, walking around with the same glory and immortality that he himself has, not like a cloud or a wisp upon the wind. Huh? But in a physical, literal, living being body with angels and all the glory of heaven and the beauty and the splendor of all that that will be. For a 1,000 years, humanity will there live with God and His saints 
and enjoy this place of peace. There will be no lion with a need to go and destroy a lamb. They eat grass just like the cow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just a slight little enzyme adjustment. Biochemistry simple. Don't worry too much about it. Teeth will recede. Huh? He'll chew the cud. The adder will lose its poison. This is what it'd be like. There'd be no more killing or destroying. For a thousand years, Satan is bound in his, in his iniquity and in his influence. And yet at the end of the thousand years, the scripture says, men will be gathered unto Satan as the sand of the sea. Innumerable. They will not want to live in the righteousness. They will not want to live in the love. They will not want to live in the joy. They will not want to live in the peace. They will not want to live in the glory. They will want, rather, they will have a higher priority to fulfill the gratification of the pursuit of their own desires. Which is, you know, it is such, think about how evil that is. You've got to destroy another soul so that you can feel a moment of joy and ecstasy. Look at it for what it really is. Look at it. Look to sin for what it is. Somebody said, I can't help myself. I'm just going to live in it. I can't help myself. I just have this great need for it. You need a heart change. If, if sin and lust and destruction is better to you and immorality and your success at the expense of others' failure, you need a heart change. That's why Jesus came. That's what it means for him to be Savior. He came to deliver us out of the realms of darkness. You know, the, there's two great, two great events that happen in the, in the Old Testament that he helps to describe him as Savior a bit more. But it's still far more than this. Number one, when Abraham discovered that his nephew Lot had been taken prisoner by the four great kings who invaded the territories of Sodom and Gomorrah. And all of the other cities joined and the kings, the seven kings joined unto them. These are historical figures, people. Okay. What Abraham did was he took his few servants with the authority of God went and he, de and he, and he de defeated these confederacy of great kings so he could rescue his nephew out of their imprisonment. Are you with me? That's Savior. That's Deliverer. Lot didn't say, no, leave me alone. I want to be here in prison. I like what they're serving. I like their food. I like their drink. I like their clothing. I, I like to be their slave. They treat their slaves really good. I'm living better, better as their slave. Are you listening to me? Yes. Then the great event of where Israel is visited by God and delivered under the, out of the tyranny of Pharaoh in the empire and kingdom of, of the Egyptians. Where Moses, that's where Moses' big day and moment was. That's where we... Read about what we call Easter, which is mis, a mispronunciation, a misapplication of what this is. It's the Passover. It's the God delivering his people from the hand of tyranny and bondage and darkness as slaves. There's nothing that describes what it means to be delivered. As, there's nothing that describes better what it means to be saved. Because Pharaoh would be the perfect type of Satan holding you and I in a place of bondage and slavery, the only difference would be that perhaps maybe everybody wanted to get free of having, or most people wanted to be free of being a slave in the mud pits of Goshen making bricks for the, for the pharaohs. But it wasn't long they wanted to go back to the garlics and the leek and the food and the comforts, which I can't really even begin to relate to. How can you go back to the comforts of slavery? There aren't any. But walking with God just seemed to be too much. 
But nonetheless, there's the story of deliverance. Father cries out to humanity and he says, and he, and he comes to every, every person. Holy Ghost comes and pleads with every human being. He says, listen, come receive life and live. Is there anybody who wants the ways of righteousness? Is there anybody who wants the ways of godliness? Is there anybody who wants the ways of purity? Is there anybody who wants fellowship with the Almighty? Because God is not, God isn't just to find that all these various ways, this, these diverse attributes of being all these different things. He's holy, which means he's absolutely unique and distinct from all other creation by the fact that he only loves purity. He only loves righteousness. He only loves life. He has no death in it, no darkness in him. I want to read two verses of scripture to you, try to tie all this together, and then ask you whether or not you want to continue on with your life or whether you'd like to have God's life. Because God's life comes to you as a free gift. I can't sit here and intellectually explain to you, describe to you all the problems and the complications of your life and the situation of humanity and give to you all a convincing argument of its origins and how it all came to pass. But it still amazes me, though, you know, how people are willing to believe some word of men about something that happened two billion years ago than what, rather than to believe what God says through many witnesses that happened 2,000 years ago. We're messed up. Are you listening to me? So now people are going to believe some crazy story of how it all took place 20 billion years ago. And that's so how, somehow that's logical. And it's a proper explanation. You need to think a little deeper about that. God is eternal. Why is that more complicated than a Big Bang? Boom. Loose proofs would be an expanding universe. And it isn't. Where there would be an envelope of the initial event, and there's not. Why is that? Why is it? Because of deception. Deception has no logic. Is willing to receive information and think no further. God is provable on every, in every way, in every dimension of who He is, and He's provable in every dimension of that which He's promised to do, and He's faithful to bring it to pass. And there's no other name whereby men's hearts can be changed and their spirits can be changed. And there's no other name by which blind eyes can open and deaf ears can come unstopped and the crippled can walk and demons that torment men are, are, have to leave by the authority, just by the authority of his name. No other name. God is an amazing, wonderful God who loves us so desperately but leaves every man to the place of choosing what it is he will believe. Open your Bibles in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. I just want to, I want you to look here and understand something. This is John. John was a devout Jew who met Jesus one day while he was fishing. And his brother James was also in the picture. And his partners Peter and Andrew were also in the picture. John was with the Lord Jesus from the very beginning. And he said, that which we have seen and that which we have looked upon, that which we have heard, that which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. Here, let me just, let me have somebody's Bible and I'll just, rather than quote it, and that way you guys will know that I'm reading it. Rather, Sometimes I'm quoting things and people think I'm still just, you know, saying what I believe. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm not expressing my opinion to you. I'm expressing to you what, the, what God said about himself in his word. Somebody said, well, I don't believe this is the, word. This is the message from heaven. Well, what do you believe is the message from heaven? So you have a short time to come in here and look around a bit and make some decisions for yourself. And the whole time it's hell on earth, give me a break. God's made a way of escape for you. All you got to do is call upon his name. All you got to do is want a change. You say, I'm done with my life. I want your life. And it's so reproducible. God will bring change to you. 
and his word is provable. And what he said here in his word is reproducible. I mean, how much more, how much more evidence do you, does, it, does a person need? And so here John says, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen. Are you looking at that? Yes. With our eyes, which we have looked upon, <coughs> and our hands have handled the word of life. Look at this. He's personifying who Jesus is. Because he's already said in John 1, 1, he said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And all things were made by him, and without him was nothing made. And then you jump down to verse 16 of John chapter 1, it said, and the word became flesh. God, eternal God, became flesh. He took upon the robes of sinful flesh so he could condemn sin in the flesh and say it doesn't belong here. So that he could show and, and, and prove to all creation, all angels and powers and authorities and men, everything that is, that sin does not belong, that evil and iniquity doesn't belong in that which was created in the image and the likeness of God. And then in that place of authority, he was able to take upon himself all our sins because he needed to die for his sins. God took upon himself the sins of the world to destroy it so that you and I no longer would live in sin and live under the bondage and, and, and the tyranny of the influences of demon spirits. This is, the means that, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about salvation and deliverance. And this is where people are confused. <coughs> the Lord has called you and me, he says this. He says, come be crucified together with me. A miracle, not a process, a miracle. It says, be buried with me by baptism and my, into my death. Not a process, a miracle. <laughs> I'm not going to go point the finger at those people who are agonizing outside the gate. I'm going to put my arm around and say, come on in. Are you listening to me? Yeah. People point their finger, I, if he was a Christian, if he, blah, blah, blah. give me a break. Love on them, get them in. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads unto life. And few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many on that road. He made it very clear. He defined it very clearly. Because men love darkness. Not because of an intellectual process. But because men love sin. They love unrighteousness. They rather practice wickedness. It's true. They rather do it themselves in their own pride and arrogance. They love it more. Not to say that they don't love righteousness or admire it to some degree. It's just that they love sin more. They love their own way more. Here John says, I saw him. We looked at him. We handled the word of life. He says right here in verse 2, it says, For the life was manifested. The life. The life. He is going to end this epistle by saying, He that has Christ Jesus has life. He that does not have Christ Jesus does not have life. They're dead. They're spiritually dead. Separated from God. Looking around, wanting to do it their own way. Willing to... I was, I was with a, a, my wife and I. She's in Oregon right now. We were sitting. Uh, I was on... I don't know where I was going. Forget about it. But at any rate, I was on an airplane on a long tri distance trip. I was writing. I was having to make some deadlines for, what, uh, for the, the book that I'm working on right now and uh, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, talk to the girl beside of you. And he gave me a specific thing to say to her. And I said, Lord, no. She doesn't want to hear a thing I got to say. You see, the Spirit of the Lord told me, he said, you tell her she needs Jesus. That's it. And I'm like, no, Lord, she doesn't want to hear she doesn't want to listen to me. She wants to be left alone and sleeping because Anne was between me and the girl. 
And so I went to type in, and the Lord said, you tell her what I told you. I said, Lord, please. I got this deadline. <laughs> I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm just having an argument. <laughs> I'm trying to convince the Holy Ghost that she doesn't want to listen. Isn't that stupid? We're all, we can be stupid at times. And that I ain't got a deadline and and sleeping like he doesn't know. Really, I didn't want to talk with her because I didn't want to get entangled by it. I been to, I know the drill. It wasn't you know it wasn't that I I was just fought, going after my excuses. I know the drill. I've been the drill. I've been through the drill so many times. I know what they're gonna say. Please, Lord, she don't want to listen here. I think I got to say. All I'm gonna say is babble to her. So I'm not listening to the Holy Ghost. Okay, so. The anointing to write the book is now gone. <laughs> Before I'm just typing just as fast as I could type. Now it's gone. So I decided, well, I'm going to get up and go to the restroom. <laughs> All the way, I said, tell her she needs Jesus. So I get in the restroom and I say, okay, Lord, I'll tell her. <laughs> so I go back, I sit back down by her. Anne's awake by this point in time. I said, do you snowboard? Trying to find some way to just, you know, try to help her. I should have just told her what the Lord told me to tell her right off the bat. She's on her way to Colorado. So, so I just, you know, it's, you know, it's time to go snowboarding. She tells me no. Real bluntly. Cold. And so bottom line of it is, I started talking to her, asking her questions about herself who she is, what she's doing, not being invasive, not trying to be rude in any way. And then she gets right to the point that as, as the conversation goes on, I said, you need Jesus. I said, the Lord told me to tell you, you need Jesus. She said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. She said, no, I don't. She said, yeah, you do. She said, I believe in all truths. I said, okay, well, that's pretty good. Is Jesus in there? No. I said, well, then why isn't he considered? Oh, I'm, we believe in all truths. We're bringing them all together, but nothing to do with the Bible. Whoa, that's pretty exclusive, eh? It's all truth. So I said, would you please start telling me something? Of course, you know, I'm pretty well versed in most religions. So she says this one. I said, you know where that come from? She's like sitting there shocked, and she tells me about it. I said, do you know where that came from? And I run, the, I run down that list, and she tells me another one. I said, do you know where that came from? I run down the list. She said, well, I don't know as much as you do, but I do know this, that the Bible is wrong. <laughs> All I really needed to do is just tell her she needed Jesus, because this, this conversation was exactly what I did not want to get into. <laughs> I'm trying to show this girl as much love and as gracious, just, just loving on her, just trying to help her understand. Look, I'm just trying to tell you. I'm not trying to be, you know, someone who's wrecking your whole belief of life and raining on your parade, but just, <laughs> just go read for yourself. Go find out these things for yourself. Just let, just let her. You need Jesus. No, I don't. Sometimes just the simplest thing changes people. You know, I watched, I watched as God just began to melt this girl, and she just, she was trying to make up for hollering at me. She got vocal. She got aggressive. I tried to stay polite and smiley, and she tried to make up for it. She didn't understand what was going on. Father, I thank you for touching her right now, wherever she's at. Dear, dear sweet girl, dear sweet girl, John's going to give us a witness of something. It's not make-believe. It's provable. This actually was written by him. It's provable. We have extant manuscripts go back to 2nd century AD. We, it's provable. It was, this was written by him. This is what he saw. 
This is what he experienced. He walked with Christ Jesus. He was the one who wrote the Gospel of John. He's also the one who wrote the book of Revelation. He wrote these epistles. He's the one who gathered together all of the New Testament documents. He's the one who was exiled on the Isle of Patmos and ultimately released by the Roman Empire. Okay, are you with me? He's telling us what he saw. He's telling us what he experienced. And people want to come up against it and say, no, it didn't happen. Well, then why, what basis are you going to tell me that this didn't happen? Because there's historical basis. And here there's not only historical basis, but the, more than that, there's spiritual basis because there is a reproducible event that will happen in every person's life who is willing to hear the Word of God because God's Word, only the Holy Ghost can change your heart, but God's Word is a vehicle by which that change is communicated. His Word is spirit and it's life. How is it that you would just refuse this hands down? No, I'm not going to agree. No, I refuse. No, I will not accept it. No, I won't even knock on that door. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, God's knocking on your door. He's knocking on your door. Those of you sitting in here, those of you watching me right now by the web, maybe watching by YouTube. And we have, I think that to date we've had probably 31,000, 26,000, something like that. 7,000 7, hours of people viewing, something like that. There's a lot of people all over, all over. I mean, there's a bigger audience right now on the web than there is sitting in here. And it spans across the globe right now. Some of them know Christ Jesus, some of them don't. The opportunity is open to everybody, but don't say it's God's fault. It's always people blaming on God while they disobey Him. Wait a minute, how are you going to blame this on God when you're the one disobeying Him? You're the one defying Him. Huh? How do you say it's his fault? How do you say it's, it, it, it's his problem? No, 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 no. He's the answer. He's none of the problem. It's our decision and our choices that we make at the end of the day that has the impact upon the state of our well-being or the, uh, the lack thereof. Here's John saying, we've looked at him. We've handled, here is the life. We, we, have, we are the ones who saw the light. The life was manifested to us. And we've seen it and bear witness unto you of that eternal life. Make it personifying Jesus as the eternal life. Which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. I'm gonna, I want to I take you real quickly from here. I'm going to take you real quickly from here to a concluding remark on this real quickly. Just hang with me. Try to hang with me. I know that you guys are used to, you know, being, you know, entertained by commercials that are targeted to <laughs> capture your attention and hold it for 10 seconds because that's the span of human attention. But we got something else working on our, on our behalf here. Just look at this verse of Scripture. He's declaring what he saw, the eternal life, the glory of it, handling it, touching it, seeing it hearing it, it being Christ Jesus, the eternal life that was manifested unto them. He says to us that which was, that which we have seen and that which we have heard, we declaring unto you so that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with Christ Jesus and the Father. Can you see that right there? The Messiah, Christ Jesus. He says, I will write in these things to you so your joy may be full. Amen. Now just go over quickly into 1 John chapter 4. Go to chapter 4. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through. I'm not going to go through all what John said to help you understand whether you're in, in the light or in darkness, whether you're walking with God or not. But I want to just jump to this point right here and just close with this. Listen to this. He says in verse 6, Chapter 4, he says this. He says, we are of God. And he that knows God, hears us. And that he that is not of God, will not hear us. And this is the difference between the spirit truth in the spirit of error. God comes, made flesh. Christ Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and the voice of another they will not hear. Amen. He says, he makes it very, very clear. He says, everyone who's of God 
Everyone who's seeking for God, everyone who's willing to walk with God, hears the words which I speak. This is Jesus speaking. John chapter 8, verse 46. Those who will not hear us, they won't hear God. And what is the Lord speaking? Is he speaking, here's a religion that you can now have so you can have a banner and go fight against everybody else. <laughs> so that you can have a unique concept of what the world is and what life is all about. No, he's just simply saying, here it is. Come out of darkness into light. Come out of death into life. John's going to say in the next chapter, in chapter 5, that verse of scripture that I just quoted, verse, verse 11, 12. Verse 11, 12, and this is the record that God has given us eternal life and that life is, is, is in his son. Why is he the son? Why is he the son? Simply because God was made flesh. That's it. God, the eternal God, became just like you and me in every way so that he could bear our sins away and bring us in to the life of God. The very next verse of scripture says this. He that has the son has life. If you look back and you'll see in uh, Chapter 2, verse 22, John's just really laying this thing down. He says, who is a liar? But he that denies that Jesus is the Christ. He's antichrist that denies both the Father and the Son. He's going to make, he actually makes a transition here, he shows us, and connects in chapter 4, the false prophet, the false witness, Antichrist, and the spirit of error. And he encloses it right there, all within this opposition against this life that God offers us. A life that says, no more sin. Freedom from sin. That doesn't come as good news to a lot of people. Freedom from sin. What, how else are we going to have any fun? That sounds like a boring life. What are you talking about? Freedom from sin. No, you just been you deceived. You just sit over there in your sin and iniquity and talk about walking in unconditional love. You're blowing smoke. Let me see it. Let me see it. Prove it to yourself. Hello. Come on now. Let's just get real for a minute. Let me see some unconditional love. There's the girls hollering at me. Just because I told her she needed Jesus. <laughs> she forsook her unconditional love. <laughs> Jesus knocking at the heart's door. I, I, I figured by now, she's born again. Amen. She, you know what? It, when it hurts the most, they holler the loudest. Yeah. <laughs> huh? If it didn't mean anything, she wouldn't be hollering so loud. I just touched the soft spot right there. You know it. Don't try to tell me you're hiding. You are, you are backslidden Pentecostal probably. <laughs> I know about these things. Whoever denies the son, the same has not the father. Verse 23. See, John's telling this on us. John's telling us these things on the highest level of authority. I saw the life. I heard him. I touched him. I handled him. I walked with him. I saw him walk on the water. I saw him raise the dead. I saw him do that which has never been done. Open the eyes of those who are born blind. I saw him transfigured as the Father talked to him right out of the realms of heaven as he stood there with Moses and Elijah. I'm telling you right now, he's the same one who said, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. I'm telling you, he's the same one who said this. It wasn't another one. It was him. He said, we beheld the glory. 
of the only begotten Son of God, full of truth, full of love, full of grace, full, fully revealing the power of God. We were there. We watched him ascend up into heaven. We watched him. We handled him after that. He, we, I saw him. I stood there at the cross. I watched him be put to death. I saw the life go out of him. I was there. We took him down off the cross. I helped bury him, put him in a tomb. Three days later, I was there. I went to the tomb. I saw the empty tomb. You can't overthrow that witness. Not when it can be reproduced in me. I'm a data point over here. And there are <laughs> millions. And even hundreds of millions over the generations like me. I was there. I was there when suddenly he appeared. And stood there in the glorified realm of the brightness of who he is as the eternal God. And said, look at the nail scars in my hand. Look at the nail scars in my feet. Look at the spear that was thrust through my side. He opened up his garments and let us see. I was there when he ascended up. And the angels came and said, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? Christ Jesus, who is taken up into heaven, shall return just like you've seen him go away. Go, tarry in Jerusalem till you're endued with power from on high. I was there when the Holy Ghost came and the glory of heaven overshadowed us and clothed in tongues of fire came to rest on each one of us and we all began to speak with a divine utterance and we stepped outside and over 3,000 Assyrian Jews who had made a a clock system, a timekeeping system that until modern times there was nothing that was, it was just so exact because it was revealed to them they saw by reading and studying the prophets, especially Daniel, that there was going to come an event and a day and an hour where the sons of light would do battle against the sons of darkness and they were preparing themselves to be a part of that great new age. But when that time came, that moment came, nothing took place. Only thing that took place was the rumor of this one, this prophet from Nazareth called Jesus the Messiah was crucified at Passover right at the time that this great event, this cataclysmic universal event that they had been preparing for for over a hundred years. Nothing happened except for our crucifixion at Calvary. Now it came in to town on the day of Pentecost because it was also a part of their timekeeping system of the events of the new age, the new dispensation of men. When in their mindset they thought the Messiah would come and rule over all the earth and all the governments of men, but they missed something, that he would come and bear the sins of the people and be cut off for the sins of the people. Suddenly their eyes are open as they see John and the rest of the... Of the 119 stumble out of that place where they were baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire, speaking in this divine language and declaring prophetically things that have never been heard before. 3,000 of them gave, them gave their life to the Lord. I believe they were a sea and Jews. I don't have proof for that. But I believe the majority of them were. And I do have proof that a lot of the early church was made up of a sea and Jews. Because their days were over. There was no reason for them to exist anymore. The cross ended the day of their existence. They did not see it was a cross, the Messiah being cut off for the sins. They thought it was the event where the powers of darkness would be destroyed and Christ Jesus, the eternal God, they would not have called Christ Jesus, they said the Messiah, the eternal God, would come, set up his kingdom, and darkness would reign no longer. And then all that happened was a cross, a bloody cross on a place called Golgotha, on a place called Calvary, at Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered Isaac, where the temple was built in the days of Solomon. Where offering after offering and sacrifice after sacrifice had been offered up from the days of Abraham unto the days of Solomon and from Solomon unto Christ Jesus. Now the great offering, which all those other offerings represented, is now there put to death for my sins and for your sins. 
He bore our sins in the tree, in the, on the tree in his own body so that you and I could now be dead to sin and alive to righteousness, live, to God, live unto God by whose stripes and wounds we were healed. This is what he did for you and me. He died and was buried and rose from the dead the third day so that you and I could be raised up to a new life. A miracle resurrection. Much of what John is is a proof, proof because as it is in today, it was in those days that people came in, they were trying to make another religion. And trying to say, no, we're still sinners. No, we're still walking in darkness. No, we still got this problem. No, we still got that problem. No, we're still under the reign of, of a sinful nature. He said, no, 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 no. He that the Son sets free is truly free. He's the one who said and recorded what Jesus said to the ruler of the Jew, Nicodemus. When G Nicodemus said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent from God. For no one could do the miracles that you do, lest God be with them. Jesus immediately says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you cannot understand nor know nor enter into the realms of the kingdom of God until you're born again. You must be born of the Spirit. You must be born of the water. This is the same, John. This is what he's saying. One more time, chapter 5. He that believes, verse 10, he that believes on the Son of God hath this witness in himself. He that does not believe God has made him a liar because he's not believed the record that God has given of his Son. And this is the record that God has given of his Son. He's given to us eternal life. And that this life is in the Son, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you have the life? I'm just asking you, those of you sitting here, those of you watching by web, by YouTube, do you have the life? The very life of God, the very life of Jesus, the very life of the eternal God, the Almighty. Do you have that life? It's a life of purity and righteousness and holiness, which just describes how we're willing to lay down our life for other people. It describes what it means to live in joy and love and peace all day long. What it means to live in every good thing and every blessed thing. He that has the Son has this life. And he that does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Everybody, I want you everybody to stand with me. You know, these are almost like a concluding remarks of John that he makes in the beginning of the gospel. He said, as many as... He says he, that God gave the authority to us to become... Sons of God, the children of God. Listen to me. Children of God. He's already made a contrast. He's, he's going to make it very clear that if you don't know him, you're a child of the devil. You belong spiritually to another family. God not allow, willing to leave us in prison, not willing to leave us in, in the place of slavery, became the Savior by means of becoming just as you and I are right now, but living a life without any kind of sin or iniquity in it. So that he could become a sin offering for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became like us, that we may become like him. And he's it. He is the door. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He said, all that came before me are thieves and robbers and liars. That's what he said. Amen. And that's true. And I hate watching somebody get their house. You know, you going to stand by and watch somebody break in somebody's house? They say, well, poor person. 
I really like those neighbors, but they're getting everything stolen right now. Is that how you are? That's not how I am. I'm going to go over there and talk to them. Hey, guys, you in the wrong house over here. What's up? For me, it's even bigger for the spiritual consequence of the decisions that people make because it's eternal. The choices you make are forever. There is a judgment and a consequence with every choice. It is proven over and over again in every dimension of society and life. God said men are willingly ignorant. His glory, His power is eternal power. Everything of who He is and what He is is made manifest even by creation. The Lord's not calling people to come into a religion. He's inviting us into a relationship and a fellowship. He's not asking us to join a denomination. He's asking us to forsake a kind of lifestyle, a bondage to a sin and iniquity, and come on over into this glorious liberty of the sons of God. He says this, as many as would believe upon, as many as would receive him, he gave them the ability, the authority, rather, to become the sons of God. The children of God, as many as would believe upon his name, to where we become part of the family, he is, as it were, an elder brother being born of the Holy Ghost. Today, the Lord is dealing with every person here in this place, everybody that's watching me right now on the web. God's dealing with you. He stands before you. He's knocking at the door of your heart. And he says, if anybody will open up that door, I will come in and fellowship with them. But he's, he's, he's inviting us. He's inviting us into a new life. He's inviting us. He's not saying, come, bring your own. You know, people say, well, God just going to accept me as he is, as I am. No, he's not. He's going to call you as you are. He's going to love you like you are. But he's going to change you to make you acceptable to him. God will never have an agreement with with the satanic realm. Light will never exist and coexist with darkness. A truth will never be a lie and a lie will never be the truth. And we hate it when somebody presents a lie as the truth. And we bought it and then we find out about it, and especially if they took our money in it. God, the Holy Spirit is here to do something that goes beyond the skills of oratory or the ability to do, communicate information. He's here to go past all of that and just touch the hearts of anyone who truly wants to know Him. He, you know, it's, it's really simple, people. The Lord Jesus made it very clear. He says, those who knock, the doors open. Those who ask, they receive. Those who seek, they find. And here's an amazing thing. God came knocking on our door. He came seeking us. He came asking us. He's knocking at your door today. He's asking you. He's seeking you. What will you do with Jesus? What is Jesus to you? Someone said, oh, he's my Savior, he's my deliverer, my whole life has changed. I tell you, he delivered me out of darkness and from a terrible life of destruction. And it's always self-destruction, people, because we're not, will, we're not willing to hear. What is Jesus to you? A person said, he's nothing to me. He's a false prophet. It's nothing to me. They're making a choice. It's not because God hasn't, want, in His love and His mercy, brought proofs. You know, Lazarus, 
and the rich man are a great example to us because the rich man is saying, crying out, saying, as he finds himself in hell, saying, oh, send somebody to tell my brethren, brethren, lest they come to this awful place because the rich man constantly made choices. He made choices to oppress and to, and, and to, and to hate and to afflict and to gain some kind of position and power at the expense of another. So I mean, we would just, look, people, I'm going to say this to you. If you need identity, you've got a problem. If you need to be something more, you've got a problem. And that's part of what was the rich man's issue. And the Lord says to the rich man, he says, well, the rich man says, send, send, send someone from the dead to tell my brethren to warn them. Let's take come to this awful place. And the Lord says, no. They have Moses and the prophets. And if they will not hear the word of God spoken through Moses and the prophets, they will not hear lest somebody be raised from the dead. They won't hear if someone is raised from the dead. His word of life that comes to us with his goodness and his mercy and his love brings with it, I know right now, at this very moment, all the proofs that are needed. There are proofs right now that are greater than you seeing someone raised from the dead. Proofs that are greater than any other. If God himself was to show up right now and begin to speak, proofs greater than that. It's true. The atmosphere has changed. And every person in this place who is held under the deception of Satan, for these moments of time, you have the liberty to know the living God. Amen. His Father has given us the authority to open up the eyes of the blind spiritually, to turn men from darkness to light, from the power of Satan, the power of God. Each person decides for themselves what they'll do. You decide what you would do with Jesus. If you'll call upon his name and say, look, I'm done with my life. I don't want to live my own life anymore. I want your life. God in his great mercy and unspeakable gift says, okay, I give you my life. Wow. The privilege. What an amazing miracle. What an amazing gift. I give you my life. You can have my life can have life and they can have it more abundantly. In other words, that goes beyond what I can describe to you, God's sake. Your life, my life will be in you like rivers gushing out of you. People, God the Father is so earnest about us moving beyond religion into relationship, moving beyond those limitations and boundaries that we've set upon Him and allowing Him to fully be revealed through our lives. What will you do with Jesus today? What will you do with Jesus? Will he be a religious figure? Will he be someone who half delivered you? Who's come live alongside you? Oh, will he be the one who's brought the very life of God into you? And today you know, you're standing in here today, you know that you have the life of God, the life of Christ Jesus, the life of the Holy Ghost, the life of the only one true God. When I say to Hindus, especially Hindus, that they have to forsake all of their gods to come to Jesus, they know exactly what I'm talking about. When I say to Westerners, you have to forsake all of your gods to come to Jesus, they have not a clue what I'm talking about. Because all of their idols and all of their gods have been made into other images that are for so, so, so much more subtle. Then the monkey god, the elephant god, the fly god, the dung god, and the moon, many other gods, 33 million approximately. I don't know who counted them up. Do you? I don't know who counted them up. I don't know how they come up with that number. It's just a reported number, so I say it because I, 
It's a lot. <laughs> Would you like the love of God to be being, being continually manifested in your life? Yes. <laughs> Would you like the joy of God to be continually manifested in your life? Because that's what we're talking about, the life of God here. We just make sure that everybody understands. Would you like the peace of God to be continually manifested to your life? Yes. The goodness yes. of God. Yes. Continually manifested. Even his provision. I mean, a lot of you talk a lot about his provision in terms of financial. And that's fine. But I tell you right now, I'm so filled with him, I don't need anything else. All the rest is just extras. <laughs> the psalmist said, Oh, bless the Lord of my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And forget not all of his benefits. Who daily loads me with his loving kindness and his tender mercies. God, who is offended by every sin and iniquity, reaches to you and me and is willing to clean us up and wash us up and, te and, 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 and perfect everything that concerns us and teach us and instruct us in his way, who gave to us his two very best things. He is the eternal word that was always with him, whom we call God's salvation, the Messiah. And then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Whew. And he's come to us so we can learn how to act just like Papa. Just like that. Thank you, Jesus. Today there may be people in this place, you're sick or you're diseased in your body, or you're watching on the web, you're sick or you're diseased in your body. The Lord doesn't want you to be sick or diseased one more. And you know what? Here's the beautiful thing. He'll heal you even if you don't accept him. He's amazing like that. He's like, he says, I'll heal you. I'll love you. I'll show you my love in every way I possibly can. God is so willing that none would perish. God's not willing that any perish, but that everyone come to this life, this eternal life, this God kind of life. Eternal life is not just a period of time, dimension of time, an endless dimension of time. It's a quantity of quality of life. Not just a quantity of time, it's a quality of life. God wants you to have this life. Sickness and disease isn't a part of that. I break off the doubt and the unbelief. The hardest place to get people healed are folks who've been standing around the presence of the Lord and, and have gotten discouraged and disappointed and come under the yoke of unbelief or doubt. And the Spirit of the Lord in His goodness and mercy is here to even bust that up. Hallelujah. Let the Spirit of the Lord search your hearts. You search your hearts. What all you need? What is it that you're looking for? Our culture and society has taught a lot of people just go chasing, chasing their lust. Living like animals. What you're looking for? What you want? Father invites you and I to come into his life. If there's anybody in this, in this place here today, once again, watching me on the web, anyone, all you have to do is say, God, I want your life. All you have to do is get serious with God because he's, he's not looking so much at words. He's looking at hearts. And the heart will express the word. I don't want to hang on to my life anymore. I want your life. And I recognize that there is no name given under heaven whereby I can be saved, I can be delivered from the stronghold and the claims that Satan has upon my soul and upon my life. And he is a tyrant. And men, he's not only imposed himself upon us, but men have responded to that in, that. that pseudo-sovereign authority of Satan and has participa participated with his iniquity. 
God stands here saying, I'll set you free. Christ Jesus stands here saying, I'll set you free. I'm the only one that can do it. There is no other name. There is no other power. You decide. What will you do with Jesus? You can't have him alongside other gods. You cannot. You have to forsake all others. You have to. You decide. What do you want? God stands here right now petitioning you. Christ Jesus here right now petitioning you. God the Holy Ghost petitioning you right now. He wants to change your heart. He wants to change your spirit. He wants to make you a new creation. He wants to make you a new being. He wants to fashion you after his own righteousness and after his own holiness. He wants to fill you with his spirit. God the Holy Ghost wants to come and walk with you, talk to you, reveal himself to you. Christ Jesus will come and manifest himself to you. And every day is still amazing surprise at all that he does. I want more of Jesus. Just sing that one more time. I want more of Jesus. That, just, just sing that. This is, this is the cry of my heart. It's what I choose. But we know that all men will not choose this. We know this. It doesn't stop us from going all over the world declaring to men God's love and giving everybody an option. But whatever you decide, whatever you choose, that is what you follow. And its end will be your end. And that was your choice, not God's. Its end will be your end. Listen to me. It's like I was telling this young girl. If you're going to follow that belief, you need to know where it comes from and you need to go and look at the results, the spiritual results of the people who believe that too and decide, is that what you want? Is that the way you want to live? Because I'm going to tell you right now, everything reproduces after its kind. Look around. I've never seen a bird give birth to a fish. Are you listening to me? I've never seen a butterfly give birth to a frog. Do right, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I've never seen a cow give birth to a monkey. Everything reproduces after its kind. You don't plant a corn of seed, seed of corn rather, and get a carrot. One's above ground, the other's underground. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Will you let him reproduce his life in you today? Will you let him reproduce his love, his peace, his goodness, his power, his divine authority, his glory, his, his love for humanity? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> his love for the Father. <laughs> Hallelujah. Will you let him? What will you do with Jesus? Just what will you do with Jesus? Listen to me. So stand in the balance. God wants those of you who know him already. He wants to cause you to mature a little bit more. To where you don't walk around so insecure. Always needing the approval of men. Needing something else. Huh? Where you just fulfilled. Amen. Uh. Whatever your need is, he's here to meet it. That's why we have church. See people grow, mature, get strengthened, understand. And all God has for them. And yeah, if you have a, maybe, maybe you are poverty stricken. Maybe somebody's poverty stricken. God doesn't want to leave you in poverty. But if you come seeking him just because you don't want to be poor, it's really not the right heart.
He'll bless you. He'll bless you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And He'll take care of every part of your life. I promise you, He's a good dad. I'm a pretty good dad, huh, Josh? Pretty good dad. But Papa's a far better dad. Pretty good dad, huh, Ruth? But Papa's a far better dad. I'm going to take care of you by taking care of you. Father's far, far better dad. He says, if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children. Of course, I'm not evil. I once was, but now I'm not. I was once blind. Now I see. I was once dead, but now I live. I was once evil, but now I'm not. I'm righteous now. Praise God. I've been made the holiness of God in Christ Jesus. If you being evil, speaking of the human race, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the kingdom to those who ask? Give his kingdom. Give his Holy Spirit, he says, to those who ask. I don't want you to be sad, sorrowful, in doubt. Listen to Satan. Be, be right. You beat you up ever again. I don't want you to live in shame and sorrow and darkness and failure and needing something more, needing to be somebody. Hallelujah. I, I tweeted today, God does not have an elite class. He has an elect. <laughs> and those who are anointed of God the most are identified by their love and servitude. Don't you want to be just like your Father in heaven? Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Spiritually. And then, of course, everybody wants to be bodily. Nobody wants sickness and no disease. And everybody would like to be financially, because I'm telling you, he owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. It's all his. There's nothing a man has done with his own hands that God needs, but he just loves to fellowship with us. Right now, in Jesus' name, I break off the power of blindness and darkness and sorrow and sickness and disease and every demonic oppressive thing and every deceptive thing, every mind-blinding spirit. In the name of Jesus, I destroy its power. I destroy its power right now. Sing that song for just that chorus part for me real quickly, just real softly. And I want more of you, Jesus. That's what I want. I want more of you, Lord. That's what I'm going for. I want more of your <laughs> presence. I <laughs> just come and worship the Lord I mean one of the things that we do around here is we worship father with our finances because he blessed us with them and all we do is through obedience cooperate with God and he works miracles in our life simplest acts of obedience will result in the greatest miracles of faith in your life find people around you hug them tell them that you love them bless them in Jesus name if there's anybody who wants prayer for anything, I want you to come. The Lord is here to save you. He's here to deliver you. He's here to help you. He's here to heal you. He's here to deliver you. He's here to open up your understanding so that you can know exactly what He's willed for you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Sing it again. I want more of you, Jesus. 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 Oh, sit in a mandala in a name that it be Shambra Bain. Anybody you want prayer for anything? Got sickness, disease in your body? You need prayer. 
severe torment. You need a change of life. You want to be born again. You want to be made a new creation. You're done with sin. You want now the life of God. You're done with your life. You want His life. He's here. He's here to touch you. He's here to change you. Touch you right now. How God touch you right now. 